It's the week of July 17th. Welcome to the Wild at Heart podcast. I'm Alan Arnold, and in the studio with me today is Sam Eldridge. And we've got a topic that I think will be really revolutionary to you in terms of your relationship, um, but not with other people. It's actually about your relationship with time. And before we get into that and what we mean by that, we're going to do as we always do and just take a moment to release everything and everyone to God. Father, we come to you in the midst of a busy world with demands, with expectations, with distractions, and we right now just release it all. We give you everyone and everything that is weighing on our heart, that is causing us to feel overwhelmed or to lose hope or to just not be fully present. God, we give you our full attention. We turn our eyes on you, our hearts toward you. And we just ask you to fill us, fill us in all the empty places Fill us with your overflowing river of life. We love you, God. And we give ourselves to you now. Our hearts, our mind, our bodies, our soul, our strength. We give all of us to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we talk today about our relationship with time, Really, the foundation is we want to view time as God does. And so what we really want is is his view of time. Because when we just look at time as how we see it, one, it's it's very limited. But, but two, if we want to approach it in total freedom, what we're really after is, God, what is your interpretation of my life in terms of the rhythm of the day, the spaciousness, the time. And we know that God is a God of abundance, not scarcity. So Sam's in the studio today as well, because the two of us earlier this week had lunch together. And this was one of the topics we just were discussing, not at first for a podcast conversation, but just because of all the the ways it impacted our day with our family and with work and and pretty much every other aspect of life. And that is just how we relate to time. And so Sam, thanks for being here. Yeah, Alan, thanks for having me. This topic, I feel like maybe I have a little bit of a gun shy from the last time I was in here and I'm worried our listeners are going, Sam's back and he's talking about time. And we, he did the death thing last time. Can we not do like the finite nature like if that's just me having that like concern for you, dear listener, then great. And don't worry about it. But I want to say like this, this is part one of a uh, two part that I think today we really wanted to dive into the the context in general. And I can't help but think of the metaphor of the, the fish that are swimming. There's a two young fish that are hanging out and the old fish swims by and says, how's the water today, boys? And the two the young fish look at each other and they go, what is water? <laughs> Yeah. Like that metaphor yeah. to me comes to mind and as we talk about time to go, how often do we actually pay attention to what's going on around us? How, how often are we living in the present? When are we just hustling, feeling like the sand slipping through the hourglass? I'm often living in the past and I forget that I'm swimming in the water. And this is one of those moments that we were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What if we were to pause and go, can we can we orient ourselves again to this very idea and how might we then live would yes. be a part two for that. Exactly. And you nailed it. I mean, we often see time in the same way we see gravity, mm. which is just, yeah, the, like time is a concept and it feels like uh, in the case of time, there's not enough for what I probably want to get done in a day or what needs to happen or what's expected of me. But I don't really have a relationship with time. It just is. Mm. And so I have to deal with it, like it or not, because it doesn't change. And the reality of it is there's a scarcity. Mm. And maybe I'm 
revealing my hand a little, a little Yeah, quick. you are a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, definitely. But it's wild because, you know, when I'll speak to groups, I notice that the common theme often is some version of when people speak about their life, there's a sense of scarcity or overwhelmed with what they have to do that weekend or or what their next project is or how to spend time between work and with family. And and many of the times it, it just keeps coming down to that concept of, yeah, there's there's not enough time and there's way more to do than is ever possible. Mm. And um, I don't know, Sam, do you, like, before we kind of get into some stories, like, what is your general feeling of the average rhythm of a day? Yeah, Alan, I think, like, my, my first thought goes to the words that come out of our mouth when we choose to examine it might actually be more revealing than we intend. Mm -hmm. Because I'm thinking of some some friends I know who they're in a season of loneliness and the days are so long. And there's the opposite experience that you're naming of, I got to get this thing. I got to get the next thing. I got to do that piece. And for them, time is actually this cruel desert of isolation that they're just kind of slogging their way through waiting for the next oasis to sustain them. So my first thought yeah. actually is uh, if we haven't examined it, open your mouth right now and say like, what do you believe to be true of time? The best is behind me. The, the clock is ticking and I got to get going. Um, time is cruel and I, I'm just waiting my way through it. Like I, I actually think we don't all have the same experience, but we think that we do. And we have some, some similar experiences probably like some pockets. Um, for me, I've been in seasons where I, I have felt <laughs> like the rat race type feeling you're describing. I literally gave myself an eye twitch last summer because I was so overwhelmed with, I need to do everything and do everything well. So I was um, renovating a house during a sabbatical, quote unquote. So a break from my work here at Wild at Heart. And into that month, I decided to take up Spanish lessons, continue working on my master's program, renovate a house from everything from painting to plumbing to repping up a deck, and also start a coaching business on the side. Oh my gosh. And it was literally like I would just go from one thing to the next. I would pause fixing the kitchen sink to take a call for an hour, to then drive and pick up something from Facebook Marketplace while doing my Spanish lessons on the phone, and then switch over to the self-help book that I was playing off of Audible to show up to class and wonder why my eye was twitching. Mm -hmm. And something in me was like, but if you want to do more, be ahead, and accomplish, this must be the only way. And therefore, time was this like, I have a stack of 10 Legos, they're supposed to go through a four Lego slot and somehow I got to cram them all through it. Wow. That's exhausting hearing that. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> I'm not still there, right? right? Was it Bart one time or maybe a bit as a teacher in high school, they said, when, you're, when your memories outweigh your dreams, you know you're headed for the grave. Mm -hmm. And that was another picture of time of that, like ever, all the good things are behind me. Yeah. Um, I know that my wife Susie is in a season where time Time is just this, like, I got to tread water to get through this week to where Sam can come home and help because she's in the wake of losing her dad. And so most days are filled with this sense of, oh, I wish the last 10 years had looked different. Or I, and like, you just start reliving those conversations. And I think about a, something Morgan said once about parents that we're always living in the future or the past, but our children live in the present and we have to come back to meet them there. And I, Interesting. that, idea like totally gets me. Susie right now is in the present, but a lot of her thoughts are for the past. Like we're describing that other side of the coin. This may be more, more sides than a coin actually has at some <laughs> point, but there is the, I can't help but think of people out after a loss or a grief, how you look backwards and, and everything has like taken on new color and you go, oh, if only I could. I think about the movie uh, About Time, which I, I assume yeah, you've seen. I have. I love it. If you haven't, go watch it. It's actually not a rom-com. It's about a father and a son, and it's going to make you weep. But I think about at the end, one of the characters gives, and I want to not spoil things for you, gives the advice of live today as though it were your second time through. How would you choose everything differently? And that idea of like, where is your perspective? What? Are, what, are, what? Oh my gosh, Alan. We like, 
we can go chasing lots of different directions, but I'm aware of, it seems like the pull is to be not in the present, whatever your pull is. So if it's yours, it's got to get it done, got to think forward. And if it's in this case, Susie's, it's looking backwards going, ugh. or if it's the lonely friend who's just like, they're just trapped by it. They're still not in the present. Right. right. And so I think the first thing we want to invite listeners into is what is your relationship with time, try to name that because it's easy just to assume it's not a relationship. It's just reality, but pull back as Sam and I are discussing this and, and just kind of ask yourself, like, how do I see the commodity of time? When you think of it, what is your reaction to the days are too long? I can't stand it. Uh, there's not enough time in the day. Our hope is through this first half of the conversation, you will leave with some good tools for understanding that. Mm -hmm. And a a beginning to that, I think, is maybe our childhood. Mm. Because like so much in life, what we grew up in, you know, kind of like the fish, it it seemed just that's how the world worked based on how our family worked. And, And all of our families, our mom and dad and grandparents and that whole home life situation had some rhythm to it. And I think back to my boyhood and both my parents worked and my mom was in real estate. And so she was always going. There never seemed to be time for her to, to catch her breath because there was always the next client, always the, the work to do, the hustle, of making things happen. Mm. And so that set the rhythm of our home, which seemed to be things moved fast and you had to go quick to get thoughts in or to, to, you know, there weren't a lot of leisurely dinner conversations, things like that. And it didn't, it didn't make me sad. It just felt like this is kind of the way things work. Right. You couldn't, you couldn't be sad because there was no alternative. There was nothing to compare it to. Exactly. And, and a lot of the conversations we had growing up were mostly surface conversations, the weather, sports, you know, local, local events that may be going on, but no heart conversations, no heart level because there wasn't time. Mm. And, and then it wasn't ever like, it just wasn't a language anybody spoke. And so Sam, like in my growing up years, I remember having this hunger for more and I couldn't quite put a name to it. And I was an avid reader and I started reading fiction and, you know, in a lot of these novels, there are these meaty conversations and, and inner dialogues of the protagonist. And, and I started realizing, wait a minute, this, this is possible. This is normal in the world, but, but I don't get any of that at home and and everything stays at the surface and as i look back at it now one of the filters of interpretation is i think nobody felt like there was time for that that was that was a waste of time when you're trying to get quick answers and move things forward and so that set some kind of internal barometer in me that even as an adult, I started believing the greatest value is efficiency, productivity. Um, The more I do, the more I am. Mm -hmm. And so who has time for small talk, for heart level talk? Nobody cares anyway, just get it done. Mm -hmm. And And that relationship with time, when I trace that thread all the way back through no ill intent of my parents or or anything other than just what they probably grew up believing, but but that was kind of the environment that that started my relationship with time in an unhealthy way. Yeah. This is such a helpful exercise. I feel like step one, listeners, is to like pay attention to the phrase that comes out of your mouth. Because like we were saying earlier, the first phrase is actually pretty revealing and probably isn't as universal as you think. Then step two would be to like, examine your childhood and to go back to the environment like you were saying, Alan. When you name that, 
all of a sudden your phrase makes a lot of sense. All of a sudden the listeners are going, oh, and Helen's idea is like, there's not enough and we got to go, 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 go. I'm like, well, that sure seems obviously connected to I'm not enough unless I do. It's not about, that's all feeding into this machine that's moving forward. I think on my end, um, you know, I, I named something similar, a manic moment, certainly last year where I was doing way too much, but there was a season and probably I'm still in one where I realized a couple of years ago, my baseline was do more, be ahead, be perfect in order to meet the baseline. And I would get really mad with people who weren't doing that as well. They could seem to like show up and not have done anything and be behind and they were somehow okay. And it made me so <laughs> mad because I'm like, well, that's not allowed for me. So how can that be allowed for you? When I think about my childhood, there were, there's like a blend of things. There's like the, the memories of playing outside and creating forts in Ute Valley Park and, and running around and, um, and also the way that a child experiences time where like, I think geometry class was like three hours long, whereas uh, Spanish for me, I really enjoyed and art. And those seem to only be about 15 minutes long, the way that summers would yes. be so fast, but um, like the spring, like fall, kind of February and March would just take forever. Um, and I also watched a dad create a ministry and write books and go travel. And like, I mean, let's name the elephant for me in the room, which is, huh, I wonder why the son of John Eldridge may feel the need to do more, be perfect, be ahead, to be on time. Wow. Yeah. Like that to me yeah. now feels really obvious of like, oh, again, like you were saying, I don't think that that was ever either my parents' intention, but as a kid, I'm watching them going, what is enough? What's our pace? What's our baseline? And they would say, you are enough as you are. And I'd be like, that's good and all, but I'm watching you create all these things. Therefore, that must be what I need to do. I must need to go create. I must need to do more. I must need to, I mean, for years, I thought I needed to sell one more copy than my dad to ever be enough. And he never, ever, ever communicated that to me. But as a kid, you're watching this baseline of your parents going, okay, this must be the way. I think of a guy I've had the pleasure of working with who his family blew up. Mom and dad blew up. Um, there's divorces, there's death, there's him just kind of finding his own way. And his experience was, I'm behind everybody else. My, his experience of time looking at his childhood was, I need to make up the miles behind I am, and then I need to keep that momentum and pass everybody mm -hmm. just to be enough, just to prove that I wasn't a waste of a life. I wasn't like... And blow it. That's brutal. Right. And you look That's at his past life. being like, right, you are, uh, Susie once used a metaphor for me of like they were all cannons pointing in a particular trajectory. And only over time do we see really where we were aimed. When you've been fired in that direction, we all kind of start in the general similar area. And in different seasons, we kind of align with other people. But man, when you have a foundation like that and you fire that direction for 30 years, you go, oh, right, all of a sudden Sam and Alan and these other hypothetical stories make a lot of sense when you look back in the childhood years and understanding of what was enough. Yes, yeah. Probably eight or nine years ago, I was trying to figure out why I felt so exhausted at the end of a day. Mm. And it, it didn't start to be in my own mind a you know, I wasn't trying to figure out my relationship with time. I just knew, gosh, I, I don't know why I'm so exhausted. I'm not, you know, doing heavy manual labor all day long. It's not a physical tiredness. It's a soul tiredness. Mm. And what's going on? And Kelly asked me to put a, a word picture kind of like describe not just how you feel, but, but what's an image of that if you were going to describe it. And Sam, I paused for a second, and then it was just super clear. I was like, I feel like somebody standing about five feet from me, and they have a carton of eggs, hmm. and each egg feels like an expectation, a project, something important, and they're starting to throw them at me, and I can catch the first one, but then the second one you know, crashes into the other egg and it explodes that one. And then 
the other one hits me in the shoulder and pretty soon I'm standing there mm. with this this mess of yolk and of just shells and and I'm and it's messy and it's it's just unrepairable yeah and and it it was a shocking image to me because I'd never seen that but as I described it she's like Alan no wonder you feel exhausted at the end of a day if if you feel like projects and requests and and needs as they're coming at you are these fragile things that that are probably going to break and crack and and you're not going to be able to hold or do what you need to with them and that was the beginning of me trying to kind of follow the trail back of how have I come to see mm. things that that I want to do or things I need to do during the day as this tense um, moment of, yep, I may be able to grab one or two of them, but in the end, I'm going to be standing there with a mess of everything rather than a completed um, well done day. And I think that's where my um, push for efficiency happened because then to overcome that rather than deal with it, I was just trying to get everything in a day checked off without it crashing and without it piling up too much where I couldn't contain it. And so that was my <laughs> attempt at an antidote, totally. which only increased the pressure because, oh my gosh, yes, yes. the I day could... was defined by, did I get everything done or not? Did I catch all the eggs and turn them into this intricate juggling pattern so none of them dropped and I put on the correct show? Having a picture is such a powerful tool. Like I, I love the brutality of yours, the messiness, the like the sense of inevitable chaos and disappointment that yours carries. And I'm curious if, if a metaphor, a picture comes to you listening right now, if that would be a helpful piece. I think for me, where my thoughts go with that, Alan, is like the experience of the person actually may be this interesting. You're, you're focusing on the symptom and we're not looking at the cause and you're naming a little bit of this. If somebody were to interact with you, they would go, wow, Alan's getting a lot of stuff done. He's hard charging. He's driving. He's more interested in the next thing. But actually behind that place in you, there's this part that just feels like he's about to get hammered with all these eggs and disappoint and be messy and it just be him being assaulted by the tasks. And they don't seem like they connect, but when you lay them out, there's this like, oh, type moment of now I actually have empathy for the part of you that's rushing to get everything done. And all of a sudden, your relationship with time makes sense and isn't just this like, hey, what you really need to do is read J.M. Comer's Ruthless Elimination of Hurry and we're going to like get that fixed <laughs> for you. That's a helpful book. I like it. Yeah. But if that's your only posture, is isn't just like curiosity about the system and that you're going to miss something. What's coming to mind for me is the, the people I know that struggle with anxiety. So like you're moving through the day, your relationship with time is this like gut-wrenching, twisting nausea of anticipation. And anxiety, whether it's about the ambiguous tomorrow or something specific or even death, I, I promise I won't go into that one again, um, is this trying to live into the future right now, trying to prepare yourself for what's coming. So you meet somebody who's anxious mm -hmm. and they're like, they're not that much fun to be around, to be quite honest. And it's sad because you want you want to have more empathy for that first reaction, but it's not. Someone who's deeply anxious makes you feel anxious because your body's right, mirroring right. theirs. But when you're able to shift into, oh, there's actually something in them that is terrified of what is coming. And they're doing, they're doing what they think to be the best way of preparing for it by becoming hypervigilant, by being ready at any point. And instead, it's backfiring into losing the day, the hours, the weeks, the years that they're in. There's this, oh, we've stopped looking at the symptom. We've actually begun to see their relationship with time and begun to be curious about where it's coming from. That, for me, was so helpful because then they become a human being again. Then you can actually like the person who is riddled with anxiety. And if you think I'm talking about you, I'm not. I'm talking about the <laughs> other person. You are great. Yeah. Well, you start to see why you do what you do on a deeper level when you go into this, uh, the way we're talking about, like um, I had a, a guy on our team a few years ago who called me on a behavior that I was doing, not really a hundred percent aware 
that it was playing out like it was. But but what he called me on was when we would have team meetings, I would always be the last one in to the walk room. In the door. Oh yeah. So if it was a two o'clock meeting, I wouldn't I wouldn't be late, but I would be there at one fifty nine fifty nine or right at two. And even at times when people would say, Hey, thanks for joining us, you know, sarcastically, mm-hmm. I'd be like, Yeah, it's two o'clock on the dot. The meeting started at two, right? Let's roll. And and total justification of of what mm-hmm. I was doing. But but I realized there was this belief that if there's not enough time in the day, I would be at my desk before then trying to crank through a couple more emails, get one other project taken care of, a phone call, whatever it was, a text. Because I knew I'm drowning in these things. It goes back to the, you know, the egg analogy, but I'm drowning in all this. So um, I'm going to maximize every second. Mm -hmm. And so the desire on my part wasn't to be the last person in the room or late. I just, it was kind of like, well, who wouldn't, if it's two o'clock meeting, wait until two o'clock to come in. And the friend was like, actually, when you get somewhere a few minutes early, your body and mind and soul can catch up to what's about to happen totally. and breathe. And you're not just a blur from one continuous thing to another. And so Sam, like that also is included. I think when we're talking about time, it's um, what, what's your attitude toward being the last person at something mm-hmm. um, or to being early or if, if um, you're running late to something you know, if it's if it's a time where you're meeting another couple for dinner and you're showing up 12 minutes late every time, you know, how is that not just the way it is because you have a busy life, mm-hmm. if that if you have a busy life, but but like a belief about what's possible or or how other people should adapt to time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I another piece in here, Alan, that's super good. I'm thinking of there, there's a variety of genres of movies that I like, um, but one of them are movies that somehow trigger this thing in me that feel really different. It's like the slowing down. It's the the thing that feels off limits. And that's something I want to point out is that there's this movie called A Good Year starring Russell Crowe and Marianne Cotillard. And the the movie is set... Russell Crowe is in London. He's a hard-charging um, day trader, stock, big money guy. And he does some trade that may or may not have been totally ethical. So he gets kind of put on suspension and he has to leave London for a little while. Like just kind of his, his right. lawyer's like, get out of here. Just don't, don't be in the crosshairs. At the same time, he gets this notification that his uncle or some one of his relatives has like died and passed him this vineyard. And so he leaves London and goes to this vineyard estate and you just watch him shift gears down to an inefficient use of time to like being really frustrated with cleaning up the tennis court and walking around this house that's triggering all these memories. And I love this movie, partly because it's one of like six that we had at the ranch growing up. So we like, you would watch it every once in a while because there weren't that many other options. Another being, it felt so alluring to be like, wait, I think I live in the former where there's that like, let's go, mm-hmm. let's go, let's go. And then something caused this disruption, which let him have the justification to slow down. And then you watch by the end of, again, the movie is a good year he ends up realizing that he's on this treasure and doesn't want to go back to that old way. He wants the slow. And I think that's an intriguing piece of like how how many of us want the vacation, want the retirement, want that. There are places in me that aren't actually at peace with that desire. So while some of me wants it, the places in me that feel that need to go create do are like, what are we, what are we doing here? Like, this is not okay. Or we have to justify it by having some big projects just being done or on the horizon. And I think another part of it is when you slow down, there's this, this phrase that we learned when we were learning to ride off-road motorcycles. And they said, speed covers a lack of skill. It takes mm-hmm. a lot of skill to go slowly and carefully over terrain. Most people will just fly over yeah. it, but that's not skill. Skill is being able to handle it. I think that's the other part of the answer is that I am not all that skilled or as skilled as I would like to be in the slow and the quiet, in the 
what do you do when you have that much space? How do, what, what answer do you give your wife when she looks at you and asks a question that feels provocative? What do you do when your kids ask you for something else? Does it tap into my sense that I don't have the answer, that I don't have enough, that I, I think there's a lack of skill there? And so I would want to go back to where I feel strong and safe and productive and justified and therefore go, I love that movie, Russell, but it doesn't apply to me unless somehow I win the lottery and get right. like a, right? Right. Yeah. What do and you think? I think you're, I think you're absolutely right. Like there's a, a longing in us and, and I think most people for there to be more spaciousness to their day, um, to have, to be able to spend time as they want, not as they have to. And so when we see movies where that's forced on somebody, you know, like the, the busy executive or the person that has another chance to relive their life in, in yes. a movie like Family Man with Nicolas Cage and he realizes, you know, this power of um, all he missed and, and it actually the power of slowing down mm -hmm. because he missed so much with his kids and his family. He didn't even see what was possible. And there is that longing and yet the world doesn't, help us get there. Like, mm -hmm. I think it's, I think it's opposed not only by our own maybe upbringing or our own assumptions or agreements, but also the world is training us to have shorter attention spans. I'm talking about our iPhones, you know, and the, and just the thumb kind of scrolling through a thousand quick sound bites. And, and so we're not used to savoring time with with people or with a book a right. physical book with pages that you actually read in turn how about even the stats on family dinners and and yeah. we do them and they feel like sometimes they last all of 120 seconds and it just right. goes so quickly how many right. spaces are we actually cultivating that slow things down let me tell you a quick uh when you talked about family dinners and i and i shared earlier you know that ours were just a blur but it reminded me, so here I am probably seven or eight years old and I don't have a ton of vivid memories from that when I was that age, but Sam, one thing I remember, cause I thought about it many times was we're at our dinner table and it's a wood table and we never sat there long at all and never had any conversations that, that really went into deep heart, heart level places. And I remember as a boy having this image in my head of if the table could just go, like I transported where we were from the kitchen table in our home to in the ocean. Mm. And we're sitting around the table and it's it's floating, but we're in the ocean. Cool. And there's nothing around mm. and there's a spaciousness of we can't go anywhere. Yeah. And now we get to just talk. Now we can just relax and and have conversations about life and our thoughts and our hopes and imaginations but that heart desire of a boy uh, as a child for something that that didn't happen and then the belief that there just wasn't time um that was huge we look at our lives today and so much of the pace and so much of the calendar and our schedules reflect our priorities but even more, they reflect our belief about how to spend time. Mm -hmm. What what will we spend our time on? How much time do we have? And what are the things that we value most? And if it's getting things done or if it's staying busy, because the busier you are, the less time you have to evaluate much of anything in your life, right? Totally. Then, then I think that can be revealed if, if, if not on a heart level, just look at your day, look at, look at your calendar, look at what you value based on that, how it plays out. And, um, hmm. the phrase early in my marriage to Kelly often was, I don't have time for that. I, I can't hmm. do that. I don't have time for that. And, um, <laughs> I mean, there was, but I absolutely believed what I was saying to her is somehow, my world has a deficiency of time. And so I will always uh, have to say no to more things than yes. And, 
and anything that seemed to kind of push into, can you do this or can we do that? It felt like, um, it felt overwhelming instead of like, yeah, I can, I can do that. Like it'll take five minutes. Let's do it. Yeah. Thereby revealing scarcity instead of abundance or even competence. And you spend a lot of time coaching people now. Mm. Um, when this kind of area plays out, how do you just tell me like, what's an observation you see if there are some commonalities between your clients, like on a broad scale, how does time seem to influence their desires or needs or questions? Yeah. Yeah. I think what I've noticed, uh, there's several big themes. And one of which is that example I used earlier that, I know Morgan in the BGS world talks about a lot, that sense of being behind, that sense of you got a late start or you squandered a lot of your early years and now you need to maintain a pace that's faster than everybody else's in order just to catch up. And then you can talk about leaving them behind and actually doing something. But that sense of like, I'm I'm behind because the relationship didn't work out or I don't have enough time because I I did, I had, I had this loss, I made this choice, I blew up a marriage or I lost this job or I did, I betrayed. And like, here it is. The people kind of walk around with like that mm-hmm. John Valjean yellow passport of like, you don't understand from my perspective is what they'll say. Like, this is true. I am behind. There is not enough. I have squandered it. And then the other are people that really need to like process grief and go, I, I'm convinced that I have lost it, that I missed the chance, that like the the ship has sailed, as it were, and that those things are behind. And there's that sense of they're living in the past and the present is lament without actual like re-engagement. And then I would say there's the categories of just maybe even some disorientation. Like there's people who aren't, we're not even talking about time, like the way of the fish with the water. Right. And I think as we, probably pivot here from I bring this first part in for a landing. Something in me goes, I'm really motivated by insight and orientation. And I, I, you can't actually change something if you can't name it. You can't go somewhere if you can't name the destination. We can't even begin to change if we can't have words for what we're experiencing. And so it's not that we're going to just stir all this up and leave you waiting for any tools. Like the very first and I think most helpful tool is the naming of it. Right. Is this this actually is the very first one to go. Have you named it? Have you examined your past? Have you examined how you feel in the present? What that actually is a symptom of, and it's not the thing itself. Uh, I tend to have poetry. Today's no exception. If you'll indulge me, here's a piece it. that I would offer. Um, in this space. It's called Clearing. And it's written by Martha Postwait. Do not try to serve the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is yours alone to sing falls into your open cupped hands and you recognize it and greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to the world so worthy of rescue. I think that would be my hope at the end of part one is that we actually aren't causing you to speed up to figure out this category and deal with it, but rather that there might be a space to be curious and wait and clear a clearing in the dense forest of your life. Right, right. We are intentionally trying to stir questions that you can take to God and maybe even have a conversation with your significant other. uh, If you, you know, if you can about your relationship with time, because the really cool thing is we know the creator of time. Um, We know God, we love God. And so what we want is his interpretation of time in our lives, in our days. And, and it begins, yeah, Sam, by, by people going, what is my relationship with time? I mean, why has it been that over the years? How did it begin? And the, the hopeful thing is 
if it's a relationship, you can change the relationship. There can be healing, mm-hmm. there can be growth, there can be redirection and transformation. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to wrap right now for the week with this question for you is how do you interact with time? What are your deepest beliefs about time and what would you like them to be? And next week we'll pick up and go into some ways to rethink time and to even actually heal some of the things that maybe have been um, places you've been stuck or, or just feeling defeated in. And so we'll pick up there next week, but stay hopeful and walk with God in the questions. And we'll be back next week with part two.